next up in the agenda, we are now going to move over to the fireside chat with Cameron Geiger. Uh, he's formerly the SVP of supply chain, IT, and sourcing at Walmart. Uh, he's got a very long and successful career there, 19-year veteran, I believe. Um, and prior to that, Cameron graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy, where he served uh, seven or eight years in the United States Marine Corps as an aviator and reached the rank of captain. And then we also have our founder and CEO, who's going to be driving the fireside chat with uh, Cameron and Saeed, welcome to the show as well as Cameron. Wonderful, good morning, Cameron. Uh, how is everything in Northwest Arkansas? Good morning, Saeed, and good morning to uh, everyone on the webinar. The weather is actually beautiful right now here after several days of rain, we're finally seeing the sun and maybe we can exercise some social distancing outside for once. Wonderful. We are lucky here in California that we still can go for walks. And I believe I am on my 42nd day of shelter in place. And if someone told me I'm going to be doing this in April 2020, I would not believe them as early as January or February. But it's a new world as uh, my last fireside chat was with Mayor Park of Seoul, Korea. And I think he has done an incredible job with COVID-19, reducing the cases to two or three per day with population of 10 million people. But his recommendation is when we go back, things will never be the same, which is very difficult uh, thing to believe, but I guess it's the reality. You know, just before we get into your background and your recommendation for our audience, how are you? How is your family? How is everybody in Northwest Arkansas? Well, thanks for asking, Saeed. Everyone is healthy and safe. Um, I have a couple of people in my family who are immune compromised, and so they are staying very sheltered in place, uh, and the rest of us are being as cautious as we possibly can. But uh, overall, things are good. One of the first responses we saw in Arkansas uh, to COVID-19 was actually uh, through the big corporations that are headquartered here. So before the government or the schools took action, we saw Tyson and Walmart and J.B. Hunt close their home offices and move to remote work very early. And then uh, very closely on the heels of that, the schools started closing and then the government, uh, the local government started taking action to say, here's what we want the restaurants and whatnot to do, following what we saw in California and Washington and New York. So uh, everything is very similar here in Northwest Arkansas to the rest of the country. and I. Uh, I wish everybody uh, remains safe and healthy as we figure out how to restart the economy. That will be great. I think that is uh, the health challenge is very big. We started uh, end COVID-19, which we call like a new accelerator. But I think as soon as we are over the health portion of this uh, time, we really need to work on the economy and new way of doing business. And with that said, you had a long stay at Walmart, uh, finally reporting to Greg Smith as SVP of supply chain. What just very high level, uh, can you tell me what a big job that is? Like bringing product from all over U.S., all over the world, which I presume is to more than three, 4,000 Walmart stores. Can you tell me like, how was like one of your days? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the days that the team is having right now are responding to the increased demand actually has eclipsed any of the demand that we had while I was there, including the buildup to last Christmas. So 
I typically in any big box retailer, especially one with as broad an assortment as Walmart, the Christmas season uh, is usually the largest. And then you've got several other areas of, uh, of the calendar that tend to spike in demand in certain categories. But with the advent of COVID-19, uh, everything started to spike through the e-commerce channel, through uh, the distribution channels uh, everywhere because uh, buying habits were changing and so many other options were shutting down that the demand shifted to those who could continue to support it. So the trends you're seeing today are very similar to the trends that I would have experienced uh, for the last 18, almost 19 years at Walmart. One of the challenges for a company the size and scale of Walmart or say an Amazon or a Target is trying to keep up with everything all at once. You don't have uh, the luxury or the time to be good at one thing and then pause and come back and become good at something else because the competition is constantly um, at your heels and the customer is constantly changing their expectations and they only get higher. So for me personally, a big area of focus was around digital products, the transformation from legacy systems to next generation technology, and then also the advent of robotics and automation and how that was going to help us deal and address the fact that we have a dwindling labor uh, pool to work with in distribution centers and in transportation networks. And that's also true of factories as well. So the acceleration of technology and its contribution to the supply chain, I've watched it accelerate just faster and faster over the years. And it was at a breakneck pace last year. I think I've vetted more than 200 startups, a lot of that with plug and play last year, uh, looking at ways for us to continue to um, uh, eliminate old ways of working, standardizing and streamlining new ways of working, and then automating those as we figured it out. That, that, was, that was a full-time job. Yeah. And if I can say, you know, you kind of uh, I know for majority of the retailer, the Christmas season is a big rush before uh, Christmas uh, shoppers, but this one is quite unusual. You know, the out of stock, uh, you know, different products. I heard people buy a lot of weights. I guess everybody's going to be in a better shape when they come back. But how, like for some of our retailers and some of our supply chain members, do you have any recommendation how they can get in front of this demand? Or, you know, quite frankly, I think my wife, when now she orders stuff, uh, sometimes there are a week delay in delivery. Uh, and we, that makes us also go to the store quite often. But for some of our corporate partner, I believe we have over 100 CPGs, uh, delivery trucking companies, rail companies. What recommendation do you have that this digital transformation and innovation may help them? not only for this crisis, but into the future in the visibility of the supply chain? So uh, great question. And I would say the best place to start uh, is where all things start when running a large business and that's with the data. And so this uh, particular crisis is very different than what we saw perhaps in recessionary downturns in the past or with natural disasters. And understanding that most large companies, CPGs and retailers alike, do a lot of disaster planning a couple times a year, but none of their scenarios, as far as I know, and I know this for a fact at, at Walmart, included a pandemic that would have the type of um, impacts on the supply chain that we've seen. So starting with the data, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for technology companies to be able to help retailers and consumer products companies really start to understand what the signals and signals were that they could have detected coming in to COVID-19 and then what the trends were that they experienced. And I think one of the most important ones, Saeed, that is a little bit different around customer behavior than what we saw with, um, with other previous activity 
will be around what some of those signals could be. And again, the opportunity, I think, is around supply chain risk management. So um, for companies that have the ability to, whether it's through natural language processing or um, other forms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, able to detect social signals that are happening in different parts of the world or able to um, collect data. And I know that um, companies like Apple and Google are working on things through like the sensors on smartwatches and whatnot. There are different signals that are emerging through IoT devices and social media that can be used to identify not only um, the trends that we saw in COVID-19, but also the signals that could actually um, predict or anticipate that a hotspot is emerging for some sort of activity that would be a disruption to the supply chain. I think uh, to your point, there's a lot of product that initially people didn't realize was going to spike. So we saw people hoarding toilet paper and paper towels and then disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer. But no one initially thought about the fact that once I'm in my house, I need something to distract me. Um, I believe Netflix will be uh, announcing their earnings after the market closes today. And I think we should all pay attention to what they say about how their business has moved, because obviously streaming is one, but so is gaming. And so uh, companies that are working in the online gaming industry have seen changes, but so have the physical aspects. I think uh, we'll find that there are trends in cycling uh, for folks who are trying to get outside for uh, people spending more time with their pets, uh, as well as exercise equipment, jigsaw puzzles, something as, as uh, you know, analog as a jigsaw puzzle will be something that we will see in those trends. And so a lot of it comes to the data. Um, something to recognize that you mentioned will continue to be a problem until you see autonomous vehicles become more prevalent. One thing we initially saw was as everyone was sheltering in place and starting to get deliveries, the gig economy had to shift from more uh, Lyft and Uber rides of people to more deliveries to the home. And that caused an actual bump in the gig economy for Instacart and, and deliveries of groceries and whatnot for Walmart and, and other uh, you know, Kroger and, and, and companies like that. So that was something that actually reacted relatively quickly. But there are only so many um, certified uh, truck drivers for 18 wheelers. And so what you've seen Amazon do and Walmart and everyone else is they've had to prioritize what goes on those trucks. So there, you will continue to see delays as long as there are spikes in demand. Once it settles out again, you'll start to see the delivery service levels on non-consumable and food items start to get back to some level of normalcy. But in a spike like this, one of the biggest shortages will be in transportation until it normalizes again. Very interesting. You talked about uh, 18 wheelers and you know one of the cost of transportation is diesel and gas. Do you feel this uh, price reduction in oil will reduce the cost of transportation globally? I think it will in the short term. And I think again, watching markets, I believe they, they said that the futures on oil have actually gone negative uh, now for the first time in history, which is, I don't even know how to you know, fathom that. I'm, you know, trying to digest that information. But I think in the short term, for the companies that are still very, very active, UPS and FedEx, as I, I think most people have seen Project Airbridge with the uh, Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, they're now shipping medical supplies to Europe, and then they're shipping medical supplies from uh, uh, China to the US as well. And UPS and FedEx have added 150 to 200 flights uh, a month, uh, just in the month of April to support that. But in addition to that, for those who have large ground transportation, I think you will see a benefit to them in being able to put more, as many trucks on the road as possible. But once we start to restart the economy and the ships start moving more and the factories start their production again, I think that oil market will tighten up. The other signal to watch is what will the oil 
producers do to slow down the supply of oil in the short term because literally the problem that's happening right now is, is the storage of the oil that has come out of the ground and the refinery into gasoline is almost completely full. There's no place to put any more. And that will, that's what's going to create the artificial limit to the top of the uh, d uh, supply, which means that the demand will certainly catch up and then the prices will start to go up slowly. But we're starting at such a low price, less than $20 a barrel, that it's going to take a while before it gets back up into the $80 to $100 a barrel range. Yeah, it is, uh, you know, the incredible. You know, I've been, uh, you know, businessman for about 40 years. And this is the first time I have seen the price of oil come down so much. Is the first time that I have done shelter in place for 40 days. And uh, I am really curious to see how Netflix is doing later on today. But what industries, what product lines do you think will come out of this stronger compared to January this year? Like if you had to watch or pay attention to demand or the signal uh, of a few industries. I mean, we are not eating more food, but it seems like we are cooking more at home. At least I know my wife is, and we are not eating out in restaurants anymore. But if you had to single out a few industries to watch, what do you recommend? I think there's, there's a handful that uh, are clearly winning right now. And the best of those will figure out how to invest in the technology that will allow them to move forward and maintain the, um, the momentum that they're getting from the pandemic. There are others that are under a great deal of stress. And as we all know, some of the best learnings come from almost losing it all. And so uh, there will be several industries that will recover, but only the strongest will survive. Uh, one of the things I was, I was speaking to a small business person here in the local area, he's actually uh, owns a brewery. And we were talking about the federal government uh, payment program to small businesses. And, uh, and as we were discussing this, we were having a virtual happy hour um, late last week and, and having this discussion. And he said um, he moved very quickly because he was very adept at being able to provide the information that was required to get the loan. And so as the checks were coming out, he got a check very quickly. One of the things that he did was that he made sure that he didn't fire his employees. He furloughed, you know, a, a bartender can't work remotely, but a bartender wants to go back to work. And so he kept all of his staff and he did everything he could built, you know, went into his own savings and whatnot to keep them going until that money came in. And because of that, his ability to recover, not only because he got the money, but because he'll be able to have all those people go back to work as soon as we start to reopen the economy, he'll be able to respond more quickly. There were several of his competitors who fired everyone. The problem with that is most of them also were not good at, at asking for the money, but they also got a lot less because 75% of those payments of the money they received must go to payroll and they didn't have anyone to pay. So the size of the check was small. And because of that, they have to go out and hire before they start. This is something to watch in small business. And the reason it's relevant to this conversation is because small business is such an engine of the economy, not just because of the businesses they run, but because of the special needs that the owners of those businesses have that drive the rest of the economy. And so that's an area to watch, Said, across multiple industries. I just thought I would start with that. When I think of other industries, um, we know that the new normal is going to be new. It's going to be different. None of us know what it is, and we're all trying to predict that. But one thing we have done is we have started to change some of our habits. In some cases, they're going back to the way they were before some of the technology came to us. Not everyone had access to deliveries. Now they're getting deliveries all the time. Some of them will decide to continue to have those deliveries. For instance, one capability that I would expect will become more prevalent will be um, setting up replenishment programs 
online for some of the basic consumables. So we know that uh, large companies in food and consumables have actually fared pretty well if their businesses were focused on grocery stores and not restaurants. For those who were focused mostly on restaurants, they are struggling mightily if they didn't have uh, you know, a, a more balanced portfolio. But for those who are focused on grocery stores and those delivery outlets, they've done very well. But they would be well suited to make sure that they are focused on omni-channel and making sure that you can go and you can buy something you know, every two weeks or three weeks, it's automatically delivered to you because that will also balance out the supply demand issues. If we have a second spike, it will keep people from hoarding toilet paper. If they know more is going to arrive in three or four weeks, I don't have to go in and stand in line three hours before the store opens to get it. Um, I think the airline industry and some of the other industries within the supply chain are going to continue to struggle until the economy opens up. But again, those who treated their people with respect through the process, whether they were furloughing so they could maintain their health care, or they were doing something else that was even more hands-on. Uh, and there, of course, there were some companies who actually were able to hire during this time period. Those are the ones that actually will recover faster uh, because they will be able to respond with people uh, and respond with systems. The other, the one last thing I'll mention, Saeed, is um, those companies that continue to invest in their technology um, or plan for the future. I was speaking with a restaurant supply company, uh, and you would think, wow, incredibly impacted. They were. But one thing that they noticed was some of their, their long-term customers who had started to build new kitchens for the future and whatnot did not stop their construction. Now, obviously, their shipments of things like glasses and tableware and everything slowed down considerably. But those who had thought ahead and said, you know, this is going to pass. And so we'll continue our investments, whether it's in infrastructure or it's in technology, taking advantage of the fact that they have time to focus on their product are going to see themselves respond quicker and they will be the winners. You know, if I can echo what you said, uh we work very heavily in auto industry and the trucking industry. And specifically in Germany in 2008 and 2009, instead of shutting down and laying off people, in Germany is very customary, you go to half time or you work two, three days a week instead of five days. And when the economy came back in the auto industry, the German uh, automakers like Mercedes, BMW, and Audi were ready to fill the demand. And they had their best uh, eight years in history of automotive. So I really hope uh, our industries come back. And uh, quite frankly, the people who, as you said, as leaders dealt with people with respect, did whatever they could to keep uh, as many people as they can, I think they will be the long-term winners of this challenge we are in. You know, I saw that you won the award of sustainability in 2008. Eight. It's actually Entrepreneur Award of Sam Walton in sustainability. That was quite early to be in sustainability world. And I would love you to tell me where do you think this sustainability or ending plastic waste? We are working with the large corporation, in fact, Tomorrow, we have a very big event in Paris with Alliance to End Plastic Waste. What, what, how do you compare the urgency of COVID-19 to take away from sustainability and for us to be more cautious of our world? Do you think it would help that? You know, it's, uh, yes, um, any any crisis, especially of one of this magnitude, 
um, is going to change the way people think. Uh, and it's also going to change the way people behave. So it's an opportunity to shift into new behaviors. Now, I don't think it's going to cause knee-jerk reactions where everyone's going to park their vehicles, uh, you know, because they have fossil fuels or anything like that. So there's nothing draconian, I think, that's going to happen. But it does give people an opportunity because their old behaviors have been stopped, that starting new behaviors is actually a little bit easier. So getting back just really quickly about the uh, Sam Walton Entrepreneurship Award and sustainability. Uh, back in October of 2005, the then CEO of Walmart globally was Lee Scott, and he made a historic speech for at least the retail industry, if not uh, overall corporate America, around uh, the responsibilities of corporations with um, environmental sustainability. And that really started the journey for Walmart. We created these um, entities inside Walmart called Sustainable Value Networks. And it was an opportunity for us to connect with our supply base and start to look at what could happen across the different categories, not only of merchandise that we sold in the stores, but also the different sorts of businesses we were in, real estate, transportation, logistics. Um, all of those different areas had an opportunity to make an impact in environmental sustainability. And it became truly one of the values at Walmart, and it became pre-competitive. We made the decision up front that this would not be a source of competitive advantage because the opportunity really impacts everyone everywhere. And if we all lean in together, the impact is greater. That led to things like Walmart's initiative on Pro Project Gigaton to take a gigaton of greenhouse gases out of the supply chain. Most of that work is done by the manufacturers and suppliers uh, Walmart's impact, obviously, is in optimizing its trucking routes and whatnot, so you can take gallons of gas out of the supply chain. Um, in 2008, we won the Entrepreneurship of the Year Award because none of this had ever been done before, and uh, in every single area, we had 14 or 15 sustainable value networks. We were literally creating playbooks for the first time on how business would interact. If you fast forward to today, one of the things that is different and I think is a great opportunity for startups and for companies is that in the early days, it felt more like art than science, a little bit more mystical and heart driven, which it makes you feel good, but it makes it very hard to get things accomplished that you can show your shareholders that this actually made a difference. As time has gone on and we've gotten more engineers and scientists involved, there are now science based targets that have very specific math behind them that calculate way more than just um, carbon dioxide in the air or something like that. There are all sorts of science-based metrics that are open and, and available to anyone to go find. And I think there's an opportunity for startup companies to help large companies start to measure the impact that they're having on the environment. And by the way, you're starting to see that happen in terms of social sustainability, things like forced labor and things like that as well where you can actually mathematically quantify what you're doing and how you can make a difference. And then you can make good business decisions on where there it makes sense for you to make a shift to a different type of technology, whether it's electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, or um, some other mode of uh, doing business based upon your ability to make an impact but make an impact that doesn't necessarily damage your PL. Both things can be true today. Wonderful. You know, I would love to open it up uh, to the audience for questions, but we sincerely appreciate your knowledge of supply chain, sustainability, and safety, because I think today's world, everything is so connected that you cannot do one, like you said, and go do it another one later on. We have to be safe. We have to have a good supply chain set up, last mile delivery, as well as sustainability. Maybe Harvey, you can see if there is any questions you would like to ask from the audience from Cameron. Yes, thank you so much, Saeed, and thank you, Cameron, as well. So we have a couple of questions around robotics um, in the chat. So 
Cameron, if you don't mind maybe elaborating a little bit more on the uh, speed to market for automation, specifically though in the vein of grocery pickup or curbside pickup and what that might look like in the storefront. Right, so let's uh, talk about uh, grocery, grocery pickup and grocery delivery are areas where the innovation has continued. And a lot of it is around autonomous mobile robots. So um, everyone has probably seen YouTube videos of little things that look like go-karts um, that can pedal around a, a, a street or they can actually bring groceries out to your car. So you're starting to see some of the retailers uh, really accelerate their piloting of moving. Once you arrive at the store to pick up your, your product and the store knows you're there and they know where you are, they can actually load an autonomous mobile robot, a little go-kart, if you will, with your groceries and send it out to your car. It improves the social distancing. It keeps people safe in a time like a pandemic, but it also allows multiple cars to have delivery sent out to their car all at once. Now, for those who are counting on a human being loading their car for them, that obviously won't be available, but it's kind of like getting used to going from a, a, a manned cash, a cashier station, a cashier actually being at a, at a, at a checkout station to moving to self-checkout. I think there will be a large number, in fact, a, a significant majority of consumers who are doing pickup that are more than willing to get out of their car when they come to pick up and actually load the groceries in their car if they're brought out by autonomous mobile robot. And I think that's one in a big area that you will see. I think um, when it comes to delivery, uh, I've been reading a lot about the trends that you're seeing, whether it's with Gaddick or Too Simple or some of the other companies that continue to work on autonomous vehicles. Nuvo is another example, who are reporting that they are logging more miles in testing and piloting today than they were before COVID-19 in those areas and municipalities that allow them to do that. And so I think you're gonna see an acceleration of autonomous deliveries to homes. The one caution in that area is, is that today with everyone being at home, it's relatively safe to have an autonomous vehicle drive up to your, your place of residence and for you to go out and do this. In the future, if I'm not home because I've gone back to work and I'm not working remotely anymore, that might start to drop off again. That's again, one of the new normal signals, Harvey, that we're gonna just have to watch and see um, how the way people change the way they work will continue to allow autonomous deliveries to home. And there, there are a few people in the audience that are scratching their heads, myself included, kind of wondering how did we get to the point where we can't buy toilet paper in the store anymore? So um, to kind of synthesize a few questions, what were some of the weak points in legacy supply chain systems that have now played out to stockouts in, in kind of where we find ourselves today? Yeah. There's a lot of um, discussion going on about whether or not supply chains took the idea of lean too far and they got too lean. So if you think about something like toilet paper, um, it's produced every day. Large companies like Procter & Gamble are delivering it to you every day and so for you to maintain more than your demand signals over multiple years, uh, or I'm sorry, your, your, your sales history uh, over multiple years show you and what you believe your demand signal is going to be for the next, say, two weeks or two months, um, means that you can get your, your working capital down on those consumable items um, to just the leanest possible level. And that works. Uh, in, in fact, in many cases, you can actually sell the product before you have to pay the supplier. So it's a very, very virtuous cycle the way you can run that. So those companies that actually got as lean as possible were the ones that ran out the quickest. There are some companies that actually maintained a certain number of weeks of supply um, or what they thought were weeks of supply in a warehouse relatively close to the cu customer so they could predict not predict, but they could respond to small peaks in, in, in demand that were occurring. But even those companies um, were out of stock very quickly because the demand spike that we saw was greater than anything that we, we had. And this goes back to a comment I made when I was speaking with Saeed before. If there's an opportunity, it's, uh, it's in, in, in two things. 
uh, opportunity for tech startups, op opportunity for large companies to think about it. Uh, one of those is uh, really starting to accelerate your maturity on the data analytics curve. So all of us have reports that we get. That's descriptive analytics. Many companies, about 60% of companies with supply chains are reporting, they've moved to predictive analytics. Beyond that, you start to get into prescriptive analytics, which is really where AI can learn the patterns and can start to tell you what to do as opposed to you looking at a bunch of data and trying to figure out what to do. And then you move to cognitive analytics where your AI engines actually just do it for you unless it's something truly unprecedented. Moving in that direction and accelerating your investment in AI will help companies stay ahead of this curve because this data is now in their history. Being able to categorize what happened and why and using it appropriately is always an important factor and it will be a differentiating factor. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity there um, for companies to, uh, to really anticipate what they're doing. The other one though, is to have very, very good relationships and transparent communication relationships with your supplier base. So that when something happens, do you have a very good um, first mover advantage or leap with that supplier to say, ah, we've seen something like this before. Uh, we're starting to see human beings behave in a certain way in certain pockets. Let's anticipate that it will spread. Hoarding was first seen in certain areas of the world like Australia and then uh, in certain parts of the US before it was in others, but it spread rapidly. Once you can pick up those signals, uh, as opposed to it being in historical data, if you have the ability to look in and look at these signals that something is happening, you can respond faster. Yeah. Well, Cameron, I can't thank you enough for spending some of your time with us. We're out of time here, but there are a lot more questions in the chat. So if you could stick around and, and respond to those in the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. So thank you again. Thank you uh, to you as well, Saidi, for spending some of your time with us this morning. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you in California or Northwest Arkansas soon. Yes, I, I look forward to it as well. Thanks to you, Saeed, and the entire Plug and Play team for putting on this webinar for all of us today. And thanks again for allowing me to participate. Thank you so much. Thanks. See ya. Take care.